Hello everyone and welcome to the final part of our Gods I Love Sumerian series. Today we're going to look at the development of Mesopotamian religion according to Dr. Thorkild Jakobsen, who's an incredibly influential Assyriologist. So far we've already covered the major gods, the minor gods, and their roles in Sumerian religion. And today, as I said, we're looking at the development of the gods uh, in the overall Mesopotamian religious system. Jakobsen uses the word numinous to describe how humans um, interact with and experience the divine. Um, it, it's it's um, kind of the, the feeling when humanity is faced with something supernatural or just otherworldly. Um, and Jakobsen argues that you actually can't describe numinosity. It has to be experienced. Um, so in order to talk about it, humans use metaphor to kind of bridge the gap between human understanding and this experience of the divine. So the religious metaphors used in Mesopotamia um, are threefold. Um, there's the power inherent in a particular phenomenon, um, like the sun, the moon, or the sky. Um, it's the storm cloud that is described and, and experienced as this roaring bird with a lion's head. Um, and also, a little bit unusually, the ringed gatepost emblem of the goddess Inanna. Uh, second, it, it's the gods as rulers. Um, so in this in this experience, gods took on characteristics of human rulers. Uh, they have um, titles right out of human hierarchies. So En, Lord, in the name Enki. Nin, meaning Lady, in the name Ninlil. And finally, there are gods as parents. So they, they care for the worshipper um, in a very personal, individual way. Um, quite different to the kind of gods as rulers experience. So this develops as what Jakobsen sees it through time. Um, in the fourth millennium, you have gods as phenomena, uh, particularly those essential for economic survival. The example he gives is um, the dying and rising god, um, who in uh, Mesopotamia is Demuzi, um, who is tied to um, the vegetation dying off in the winter and then coming back again in the summer. He's tied to the harvest and also to um, domesticated cattle and sheep. Later in the third millennium, you have the idea of gods as rulers. This is directly tied to the early dynastic city-states. Um, at this time, kind of uh, cities are, are gaining more power, more territory, um, and the very head of that state is the king. So it made sense to the Mesopotamians for their god to kind of be a parallel figure in the divine realm. Um, and finally, in the second millennium, you've got um, gods as caring parents, personal gods. Um, it's a very individual way of experiencing religion. It's quite different to the, um, the overarching state religion that you see in the early dynastic period. In the first millennium, this changes again with the um, kind of the rise of the national god. With the expansion and increase in power of Babylonia and Assyria, um, individual gods, um, particularly smaller city-state gods, are syncretized with the two major national deities. For Assyria, that's Ashur. For Babylonia, that's Marduk. Um, so uh, local gods may retain their names and characteristics, but they're viewed as being an extension or a facet of the, um, the, the big high national god of the empire. So, in this series, we've covered the major gods and the minor gods in the Sumerian pantheon, as well as their roles, and we've just covered the development of, of the conception of gods in the Mesopotamian religious system. Uh, check back tomorrow for our next video, A Five-Minute History of Mesopotamia. Josh is putting it together right now. I don't know how he's going to do it, but if anyone can do A Five-Minute History of Mesopotamia, it's him.